classes is that I've started with what's called the chromatic scale. You can start anytime, so if you started. Recap. Yep. I started with the chromatic scale, and our scale system is divided into what's called half steps. And anytime I talk about a scale, I'm talking about a ladder. It's just like a ladder, it's degrees. And our scale system works in half steps. So the, the raw material that we have to start with is called the chromatic scale. And that goes from C to C, the octave, in half steps, which would be C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C. If you'll notice, I didn't mention E sharp or B sharp. And the reason I didn't is if you looked at, the, at a piano keyboard, those are the only Sorry, two spaces on the keyboard where there's not a black key in the middle. Because the distance between E and F and B and C is already a half step. So that gives us the 12 notes of the chromatic scale. Why is it called chromatic? It's Greek is, uh, Greek is the root word, chromo, chromos, color. So that's where we get that name from. It's a color scale because it has all the has all basically all the pigments in it, if you want to make that analogy. That's what the chromatic scale is. So from that, also, what the kind of harmony that we're going to be talking about is harmony that's based on our our culture here, which is pretty much what we've done over the centuries, uh, sort of European classical tradition, which is where we derive how we derive the major scale from. Why did we end up with that? I'm not exactly sure. It sounds good to our ears. Part of that has to do with the overtones in the notes, I think. There's something called, you don't have to remember this, but there's something called a harmonic series. Like, and certain notes don't only have the fundamental note that they are, they also have overtones above them. And, and the way that these combine and the way that they, is, is a pleasant sound to our ears. Now, that doesn't mean that the chromatic scale is the only scale that you can have in music. Obviously, it's not. I mean, subcontinent India, they have what's called ragas. They have scales that have 12, uh, 18, even up to 20 in the 20s scale degrees, which we don't have. Our music is basically 12, 12 tones. And those 12 tones are equally separated into half steps, which also wasn't always the case. In the Baroque area, era, this became known as well-tempered. And it's well-tempered because it allows us to modulate. Before well-tempered, you could only play a song or a piece or sing a song, or not sing but so much, but play in, in one key because if you modulated, if you went to another key, you were out of tune in that key. And uh, there's vestiges of that still with uh, instruments that don't have frets, like violins, where you can actually play microtonally between, between the notes. And that a major third, what we think of as a major third, is a quantized version of a real major third. A real major third actually sounds sharper than what we are used to. And there's other intervals that are not the same. But it allows us to modulate, and that was uh, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote the Well-Tempered Clavier, sort of celebrating the fact that he had a keyboard where he could modulate. So, okay, so that's that's where we started from. Then we got to the the, the major scale, it's the C major scale, and what I did there is because we have twelve half steps going across, <laughs> this scale right here, the C E F G A B C. If you'll notice, I put these little indentions right here, and I, and I wrote down what the distance was between each of these intervals. So this is a whole step, which is two, two half steps, right? Another two half steps, a half step, two half steps, two half steps, two half steps. Right there. So, so what you have then is you have whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. That's the formula for a major scale. That's, that is our primary building block right there. Everything else in music, the way that we know it and the way that we listen to it, is derived from this scale. Is this the only scale? No, there's lots of scales. But they're all derivative of this. And the way that we know there are other scales is because we know this scale. It's sort of like the analogy I make. You know something's bad because something is good or else you wouldn't have any frame of context for it. You couldn't say it's bad if you didn't know what good was. 
So we don't know what any other scale would sound like or quantify that if we didn't know what the major scale sounded like. So that's it, and everybody can kind of think about that's our major scale. Okay, the next part, we have that, and then I discuss what part of music that is. When you're listening to music in a linear fashion, so it's going like this, da 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 da, and it's moving in time like that. That's the horizontal aspect of music. If you were looking at on a piece of sheet music, you would look at it as it was happening, as the line is happening across like that. That's the horizontal, the line aspect, the riff, if you want to call it that, or anything, any the, the melodic contour of a piece of music is the horizontal part of music. The vertical part is where there's notes on top of that, like this. So then you have that, and that's what we're going to talk about. That's what the, uh, the whole concept of harmony is. And harmony, for, for any, any number of reasons, when things are harmonious, they're working well together. Harmony, they're working together. Each, when we build a chord, each one of those notes in the chord has to work together to produce a pleasant sound. And sometimes in harmony, uh, it doesn't produce a pleasant sound. It produces a sound that makes you feel edgy. You're wondering what's going to happen next. But that's all part of it. I mean, that's part of what makes music so beautiful. It's not everything isn't just what we call a pretty sound. And, and what happens, too, the more that you learn to appreciate music, the more that you listen to it, you'll start appreciating those sounds, too. And there was a time, and if I heard this chord, <laughs> Because <laughs> it goes to you know, it, yeah, it's you hear that sound? You probably like this one. That's more consonant, isn't it? But this, that's a jazz chord sound. Okay, so it's got a real long name and it's very scary sounding. But if you use these chords in context, and that's the other thing about music. Everything is contextualized in there. And the other thing that I did on those on the other courses is I play this note right here. And then I play this note. Now this note is still going. But now, doesn't it sound different because of that? This note is contextualizing this one. Just like this note is contextualizing this one. And then this one, all of a sudden you have a so I'm hitting three tones at the same time, which is the vertical aspect of music. So I'm hitting all of them at the same time. I could have hit this one, or this one, or this one. But each one of those is a different color. But that note is still playing through every one of those chords that I just played. It's still, and if I did this for like half an hour, you get really, really Right? This not so much. This even less. And then if I went like that, like that, all of a sudden you're hearing tones that are all playing on top of each other, which sounds completely different than this. Right? See how different that is? All of a sudden you add those tones on top of there and you have things that are much more interesting sounding. And that's what harmony is. It's how do those notes relate to each other? What are the relationships between them? I think harmony more than anything is about relationships. It's how the notes relate to each other. Because I can play this note, and now I've got you where you're thinking, every time I play that, I'm going to play this one next. But what if I do this? That note's still in there. But now I'm playing an A flat chord, not a C. So what this used to be the root of the C chord, which means it's the anchor note that we call the chord by, now all of a sudden it has a subordinate role here. Now all of a sudden it's not the root anymore, it's the three. And you can keep going, you can keep going on like that. And each time that you play that note, it's still sounding at the same frequency, but it's to your ear it sounds completely different. That's what also the other thing that makes harmony difficult to learn at first. Because there's so many different contexts. There's so many different chord progressions. 
There's so many ways that that note acts. Like it can be the three in a chord, it can be the five in a chord, it can be the seven, it can be anything. It can be the sharp five, the flat three. But it's still, it's still solid, it still is its note, but the notes around it are contextualized. And if you do, if you do choir, sing in choir, you know that to be true. That's why in, when you're first learning how to sing parts in choir, why it's so difficult. Because your ear wants to go, for most people that are inexperienced, your ear wants to go to the melody. If you're anywhere near the melody and you're just learning your part, you don't want to sing your part anymore. You want to go where the melody. That's what's difficult about learning. That's what it takes. To dis that's the discipline side of learning how to, to sing parts, is, is doing that. But the, to, to create the harmony, that's, that's, that's the challenge. And that's, that's actually, you know, that's the goal when you sing in choirs, to make something that, wow, I'm singing my part, I'm sticking with it, I'm not going to veer to the left or right, I'm going to sing my part. So, and having said that, Sophia, yep. let's do our little song together, okay? <laughs> we're going to do... We're going to do, we're going to alternate, <laughs> Matt, Matt's going, yay, participation. It's a, it's a simple, it's a very simple chord progression, and I've kind of mapped it out, and um, how it's going to work, for those of you who don't know how to read music or understand music or anything about rhythm, it's just going to be, I'm going to, it's going to go one, two, three, four. That in music is called a measure. It's four. And then another two, three, four. So, Sophia, if we could, um, if you could play, I don't want you to play the progression yet. I just want you to, I want, who, who in here is a soprano singer? Oh, besides Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So why don't you give them the, the soprano, their note, their, their pattern there. Easy enough? Okay, who are my altos? The alto is the real hard part. Play the alto part. <laughs> That's the alto part, right? Sounds boring, and by itself it is. But, but listen, if, let's put those two parts together. So, what's the soprano part? I'm not hearing them very well. Okay, so let's start at the top. One, two, three, four. Don't drift. Let's do it again. Okay, the alto stay on the D note. Dum, dum. So play the tenor part. <laughs> Okay, let's try the whole thing. One, two, three. 
two, three, four. Yes! Great. So you just, we just sang a sequence. <laughs> Thank you. We just sang a sequence of, of notes together. We also, and this also demonstrates, we sang horizontally. Like if you would have sung those parts without all the other parts, that's what you would have done. Even the boring alto part. <laughs> you would have just been doing that. But you see how, and, and that part would not have sounded the same without the alto part. So you can make a lot of different analogies that way. I mean, you your head work, in, in, in your family, like interactions, that's what harmony is. Exactly what it is. Everybody doesn't always get to have the great tenor line when you're moving the whole way down, half step wise, chromatically. That to me was the interesting part. Sometimes you do the alpha part. Sometimes you do the soprano part. Sometimes you do the bass part. So yeah, that's that's how it works. What was that? I said, what's the bass part? Oh, we did. Want to add that in there? <laughs> Where's the bass? <laughs> Who's the bass singers? Okay. I'm sorry I left you guys out. We're not going to talk about it. One, two, three, four. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. And there was a lot of things happening in that little, that little snippet right there. We went from a minor chord to a major chord to a dominant seventh to a minor seventh. There's no quiz on that, but, <laughs> yeah. but that's what we did, you know. And that's y'all participated in that. And that's what what choir is for those of you who aren't in choir, which I would say would be a great thing to do because you can learn the more the more that you do this sort of thing, the better you get. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do now is recap real quickly chords, and then we're going to move on, and we're going to do four-part harmony. Last time we left off a three-part harmony, but there's also four parts. There's actually more than four parts, but the two big ones are three and four-part harmony. Four-part harmony is generally what jazz musicians play by. You rarely hear jazz musicians playing in like a triad, like a G triad, or a triad. They're always coloring those notes. It gives the music a sort of a... Um, well, it swings for one, which means that the rhythm isn't, it's like ours is just usually like this. But in jazz music, they're swinging it. And their chords are a lot more colorful than what we normally use. And they're, they're also, a lot, it's, it's a lot, in some ways, more experimental, more bolder sounding. Uh, in rock and roll and, and contemporary music like what we play, it's generally based on triads, although we've gotten away from that. Even in worship music, you generally, I mean, it's been a while since I've heard the one chord, which is what the what a song is named after, where, where the, the one chord doesn't have the three in it anymore. And what I mean by that is, just to give you a reference, like, if I play just a C chord, like this, you hear this, this has, has a three in it. Generally, a lot of times, we'll play it like this. You don't hear this. That's the three. And the three in a major chord just gives it away instantly. Anytime you hear the three in a chord, it, the chord has been given away. So what happens is, is that I think over time in the, way, in, the, in the music that we do now, there's, a, there's more ambiguity to the chord. So if you don't play the three in the chord, if you instead of playing the three, you, you add a two, sorry, add that instead of this, you're adding ambiguity to it. Because then all of a sudden your ear doesn't, isn't sure is that major line doesn't matter. Yes? I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Are you saying that you're um, strumming more strings than the three strings or the two strings? Or the oh, it, it's, not, it's, it's not the number of strings that I'm strumming. It's the notes within that. It's this note. It 
sounds brighter. Brighter this way? Yeah. I think so. And that'll be still considered a chord? Yes. Well, this, actually, that's a very good question. No, it's not a chord. In order to have a chord, you have to have three different notes. This doesn't satisfy that. This is a chord, though. But the two, because you've got three different notes. In there. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a C with a suspended second. So that's a chord, because that has the C, the G, and the D in it. So I'm going to, I got a little ahead of myself there. So. But anyway, so what we have also in our system is what's called, tri it's a triadic system of creating chords. And I'm just going to blow through this real quickly because I want to get on the four part harmony. So what that means is when you see the major scale like this, and you see, very important, this formula right here, that's the formula for every major scale. So if you started on a D, you still have to satisfy this. And that's the reason we have the black keys on a piano. It's the only reason. The only reason, don't let any of that ever stump you. If you went to a, a, a key as, as strange as F sharp, where you have six sharps in it, the only reason you have six sharps is that when you start on F sharp, you have to make it sound just like the C scale. And the only way to do that is to introduce those, the black keys in it. Because music, uh, even though it is extremely an emotional medium, it's also very mathematical. And it makes a lot of sense. It's logically laid out. It's mathematical. Mathematics. So anyway, so triadic, tri, three. What that means is that we garner our chord tones every third scale degree. So if I start on C, that's my next one. That's my next one. So a C, an E, and a G make up a C chord. So I go to the next one. A D, an F, and an A make up the next chord, and that's minor. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this right now because we've covered this before, and you can watch it on the video, the former one. The reason that this is major is because this has a ma what's called a major third. It has four half steps between this note and this note, where when you start in D, there's only three half steps. That's called a minor third. So you have the, you have the contrast between major and minor. Major having what I would quantify as a happy sound. You don't have to think of it this way at all if you don't want to. And minor having more of a sad sound. So if I played the same, if I played the same C chord like this, <laughs> This would be the minor. You hear that? That's like sort of a melancholy. What I what I call melancholy. Minor chords don't always have to be melancholy, but that's the, the chord quality. If I'm listening to it in a vacuum, that's what I would say. It has this more of a sad sound to it. And so what we did then also is we harmonized the whole scale. And if you wanted to write this down, I think it's pr it's pretty important to know this as far as like scale degrees in the scale, because for every note in the scale, you can harmonize it. And how do we harmonize it? With the triad. So we stack two more notes on top of each note that we're starting from. So C has C, E, G. D has D, F, A. E has E, G, B. F has F, A, C. And so on. And then when you get to like B, you loop around again. So you have B, D, F. And then, you, then you're all over. You're starting all over again from this point. That point is called the octave, by the way. Frequency-wise, it's twice as high as this note right here. And once you get to here, you're starting all over again. Except that the notes are twice as high in pitch than they were. So I'm going to recap this real briefly. In, in a major scale, the C, the one chord, is a major chord. The two chord is a minor chord. The three chord is a minor chord. The four chord is a major, and you can figure all of this out if you just do this in thirds and with the distance that's right here. The first, the first criteria that has to be met is that the distance from the root note that we're calling the chord from has to be four half steps away, so that's a major instead of three half steps. Whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Then the G, major, G, B, D. The B, the A, minor, A, C, E. And the B is the strange one, 
It's the only one that's different. It's not major or minor, it's diminished. And it's called diminished because it's comprised of two minor thirds. This chord right here, the major chord, is comprised of a major third and a minor third. That's the distance. So anytime you're creating a chord from the root level, the name that you're calling it, you have to satisfy the first between the one and the three when you're close voiced like this, that has to be a major third. The next interval has to be a minor third. So in order to make a major chord, you're, you're, you have the interval of a major third and a minor third. In order to make a minor chord, minor chord it's exact reverse. It's a minor third and then a major third. That's the difference in the chord quality. So the chord, the, the, the reason that we think of a chord as being different or sounding different, one sounding sad, one sounding happy, is a very mathematical formula. And then when we get to this guy, the <coughs> two, we have all of a sudden we have two minor thirds. That's what gives us a diminished sound. And that sound, you probably won't think it's very pleasant, but by itself it's not. Instead of this. That's a B minor. That's a B major. See how that, that's, that's, a, that's a prettier sound or, or a happier sound? A little bit sadder. This one is, doesn't know what it wants to do. Although I always hear this note wanting to go up. It wants to resolve itself. Chords like a diminished chord, and, and we'll, we'll cover at some point too, augmented chords. Those are chords that want to go somewhere. They don't want to stay where they're at. They're pulling somewhere. And usually they're pulling either to the five or to the one, and I'll explain that in, in a minute. So, what so did what, you just say about the diminished? That's a what followed by a what? Oh, it's it's two minor thirds. Two minor thirds. Yeah, from root position. So the B to the D is a minor third, and the D to the F is a minor third. Oh, okay. Because so, it's three half steps. Yeah. Yeah. And each interval is only three half steps. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I want you to know that you have now are empowered to create any major scale and know all of the chords of that major scale if you follow this. I'm not going to, I won't kid you, it's not easy work. A lot of it's just memorization and thinking about it. You have to put time in to do this properly. I mean, I've spent countless hours just think. I just think about this. I mean, when I was learning, I just think about this stuff because it, I it had to make sense to me. I, I mean, I probably explained this before. In order for me to actually go on playing as a musician, I had to understand what it was because I felt there were a lot of situations, especially when I was younger, that I felt foolish because I didn't know what I was doing. And if somebody said, do this or that, I said, well, do what? I didn't understand it. This is the building blocks. This, if you get this, if you get even this part right, you are far ahead of the game. Because everything that's complex that follows after this all derives from this. So you can contextualize whatever, if I say, uh, you know, in, in, like at some point in your musical career, I'll say, well, that would sound good if you played a 13th flat. You will know, you will know. Even if you can't play that chord right away, you'll know how to make it. Okay. It may take you a little bit, but you'll know how to make it. And that's what this is all about. Just that sort of thing, so demystifying it. It's, it all is very logical and very mathematical. So now we're gonna move on. Now we're, we, this was what we did was triadic harmony. What we're gonna continue doing is still triadic harmony, but it's four part. What we have here, what I call three part, is we have the root note and you have the other two notes. The four part adds one more third, one more triadic interval. So <coughs> in the key of C, which we're in right now, it would be C, E, G, what would be my next note? E. D. D. That's right. So now we're harmonizing the C major scale to four part harmony, not three part. So all of a sudden, I have this new, this new chord tone, which is B, and it sounds. This is a C major. This is C major seven. Yes. So the C major seven is when you add that B. Yes. That's correct. 
that makes it a major seventh. And the reason you call it a major seventh instead of just a seventh is because when you go on a little bit further, you're going to find out there's something called a dominant seventh. That's a different kind of seventh. But do you hear that? To me, this always sounded like, when I was a kid, it always sounded like a lounge. <laughs> this, this was like folk music or, you know, rock and roll, but this was... But that's how, and that's not a bad thing. If you learn to quantify sounds like that, it's very, very helpful. I remember when I was when I was uh, really young, I was in my twenties. I was learning. Uh, I went to college and I was learning sight singing, and they used to tell us to remember intervals, like so that you could remember them. Like, and I still remember my Bonnie lies over the ocean. That's how I used to think of a major sixth. So, uh, uh, so I knew that that interval was a major six, and then the theme to Star Trek was the. <laughs> <laughs> that was one, that was you know, uh, that was another one that I remembered. Or and then I had an, a, a way of, of remembering a fifth, a way of remembering a fourth, and thirds and, and seconds were easy because they were kind of close together. The further away you went, it was more difficult to remember. Excuse me, to remember those intervals. In the same way you should do that with chords. Your major seventh chord should have a, a, a particular kind of sound to you. Like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that, or it, it's like smooth jazz. Like, like, you know, like if you're driving at home, and I, I, I like to listen, my wife and I both like to listen to smooth jazz. There's a lot of, of major seventh chords in there. Yes? So, since there's a major seven, is there a minor seven? There is. Okay. Beautiful question. Because our next chord, D, F, A, what's after that? C. That's a D minor sub. Now, the reason, I, I'm just going to explain to you, there, there is also, don't think of this right now, just store this little bit away. There's also a D minor major sub. I'm not going to talk about that. No. <laughs> but that, the, the, the C major 7 is because that is the leading tone to C, okay? And it's a half step away from the tonic, a half step away from the tonic. In a minor 7th chord, the 7th degree, our third, <coughs> the third interval, is a whole step away. So the note C that makes the 7th in a D minor 7th chord is a whole step away. Whereas in our major, the seventh was only a half step away. Hence the name, major, minor seventh. And the quality of the sound of that chord, the second degree, is a minor sound. So, but of all of them, of all the minor chords, the minor seventh is the most major sound. And the reason for that is, and we're going to get into this too, is because you're layering two triads on top of each other. And this, that's an F triad, I'll just tell you right now. Now what happens to it? You see that note? It makes all the difference right there. So what we have here is we have an F, a D minor triad, which is, and then we have, so we have a D minor and an F major triad, and that's what makes that minor seventh sound like that. I know. I'm going to explain this more fully as we go on. That's, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. To That's okay. Um, I don't have the bass to build on, okay. so I kind of That's don't get it. Perfect. Um, but, okay, so let's say a C major 7. Yes. It's a C major 7 because you started with the C. Yes. It's major because every other one is in the major category. Because of the first interval between these two. That's a major interval. It's four half steps. So it's the interval of a major third. So a whole is two steps? Yes. A okay. whole is two steps. So, And if you look at here, there's two whole steps between this and the E. So uh, two whole steps is a major? A major third, yes. Okay. I know, I know. And then um, 
Why do you call it seven? I mean, Be, uh, because it is in the chord itself. It is the seventh degree of the chord. So we're not we're using this as our base reference. But when I'm saying like in C, it's fine because that is uh, actually is the seventh, the B. But when I'm talking about D, it gets shifted over one. But only when you're talking about the intervals, not when you're talking about the, the, the chord scale degrees that it's built on. So that the C note is the seventh note in D. It's not the seventh note in C. Does that make sense? I don't know. <clears throat> I guess I don't understand just, just by lack of no, musical no, okay. knowledge of what you're counting. Okay. It's not those numbers at the top where C equals one. These numbers are the, are the numbers the degree numbers in the C scale. So anytime, if like, if Matt's explaining something to the band and he says play the, and you're in the key of C and he says play the four chord, that's F. That's what you know. Okay. When you build the chord, then F is kind of like the one only for, because you're building the chord off of that now. So F, that's a very good question and I'm glad you asked it because this all of a sudden then becomes the one. So you, when you're building off the F, that would be the three, that would be the five. Do you see how that works? Okay. So, of the chord, not, okay. not of the scale, not of the key that you're in, but of the chord that you're making. So like in D minor, that would be... Two? Yeah, well, the F would be the, would be the three, see? Okay, like that. yes. If, uh, five. That yes. would be the five. And then each time you go to the next one, it'll shift over one more. Okay. When you're talking about the chord, not the key system. That's, that can be a very confusing point. I'm very glad you asked that, because I thought about that a lot too. So you were actually shifting emphasis then, but only to make the chord. Because the chord has to have a one, a three, and a five. So when you start in D, that's one, that's three, that's five. Start in E, that's one, that's three, that's five. Mm -hmm. And that's how we get the seventh designation for it. So if I went up on D minor, I'm going D, three, five, seven. I'll take it one step further, go to E, that's one, three, five, seven. Chris? Yes. When you were playing on the on the guitar, yeah. they weren't necessarily in this order. Because, no. Because you might have the C, the E, and the G, but the G was yeah, it was on a lower string, so it was right. actually in a different octave. That's a that, and that's a voicing thing, rather right. than anything. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, like if I were the C major scale, <laughs> this would be your first. Here's your second one in four part harmony. Okay. See how that goes up like that, and then you, you continue like like that. So the, the chord voicings is like as a, it's easier to do on piano, right? The, the voicings, the, the notes are closer together. But that's how they would sound. You would, and if you here's another very interesting point. If you picked any of these notes when you're making the chord and you started from the E and you did that, like you would notice that you have a, another scale going on because none of these. Because we're talking about C being the first one, when you put, play the C major seven down there first, all of a sudden, as you're playing it, if you say, well, what does it sound like from the E? You already got the E there? Then you'll notice what your next notes will be. will be going up in thirds and like this, every time you're going up. So that you, your C note is going C, D, E, F, G, but your D is going D, D, it's going up like that too. So you have all of these different melodies going up, ascending, through the chord scale. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Does it, does it make does it make more it sense? It makes more sense. Okay. Yeah. Like it, it might help like if I did on on the keyboard. But here and then you hear, you hear that scale? But here I could do also going up the scale at the same time. So it's also creating a line, just like the line you're familiar hearing. The next one. 
next chord is going is doing the same thing. So we have this, and then this one. The reason I'm hitting, double hitting those is those could also be your starting point. So that you also, if you saw it in music, it would look like this. I'm not even going to write the staff down. It's just that it would look like this. Let's just say that's our C chord. And the next one would be like this, a little bit higher going up. The next one would be like this, a little bit higher going up. And this one, a little bit higher going up. So that er I'm not very good at this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see, and, and every note in there is going up scale degree wise, like this. And, and only following the formula of the C major scale. It won't go anywhere else. It'll stay exactly where it is in the C major scale. And that, by the way, is another term, a, a very expensive term called diatonic. Yeah. Whenever anything stays within the chord sequence, whenever any note that is in the C major scale is said to be diatonic to the scale. In other words, if I all of a sudden modulated and went to D major, the F sharp in the D major chord is not in the chord anymore, so it's in the non-diatonic tone. That means that you can go anywhere you want out of the scale, but you're not going to be diatonic anymore. Diatonic just means it's part of that sound, and you leave that in that there. Okay, so we got to the D, we got the D, which is the second degree, which is a, a minor seven. So let me recap that. Our first, the tonic. This is what, when I say tonic, I mean that's our root note, and that's what the chord scale is named after. The tonic, it's the one chord. When we're rehearsing, we go to the tonic, go to the one, same thing. This is the two chord, D, F, A, C. The three chord is what, E? The next note? And then Yes. D and B. Because you loop around. You have to make sure it's always thirds. Right. Yeah, it's just over on the corner. You just you just step a little further up the key. <laughs> That's also a minor seventh chord. So C major seven, D minor seven, E minor seven, and then we get to F. A, C, E, that's a major seven. The four chord, major seven. And the reason, if we look at, let's look at the seventh note of the, of the four. F, A, C, E. How far is it away from the top? From seven the, from the one, F. It's a half step away. Right? Just like in C major, C major seven, the B is the seven. It's a half step away from the C. Same thing with F major. Because it's seventh degree. Talking about chords now, I'm not talking about the scale, I'm talking about the notes in the chord. The one, the three, the five, the seven. The seven is a half step away. It's the leading tone seven, so it's a major seven. And is it a major seven because the F to the A is a <coughs> Is a major third? Well, yeah, it's a, it's okay. it's major. The chord quality is major, and then the interval quality is major. Okay. Yeah, there's there. It, that's a, that's a, also a good question. The chord quality is a major chord, but that we also, when we're talking about intervals, we can talk about a major third without it being a, a major chord, because a major third is an interval. It's not necessarily it. If you stack the root and then a major third, yeah, you're going to get some derivation of a major chord then. But it's also an interval. Major third, minor second, sharp eleven, and all of those are third. When, when you put these the little these there, the and you put the yeah, and you put the, the whole whole half. Until mm -hmm. I got home and wrote that down I didn't realize those are the black keys. Yes. The W's are the black keys. 
Well, yeah, well, like it, it, it suddenly became clear to me. Explain that to me. I thought you meant between F, like E and F. Well, there's no black key there. Right. So the W's are the black keys. Right. There's one in between. Right. There's, yes. there's one That's, there. Oh, on the I see what you're saying. That is like the black key. That's there's, correct. There's a black key correct. there. Correct. Good observation. Did we all get that? <laughs> That's a very good observation. That's exactly right. Wherever I have that and there's a W underneath it, there's a black key. So if you have access to a keyboard or a car or whatever, you can if you and you play those chromatically across, you'll see that it's all half steps, and then except between those two and those two, those are already automatically half steps. They don't have a, a black key. Okay, so it's probably a good thing to write down, and and also in the um, in the syllabus that I created, you'll, this information's on there too about four part harmony, three part harmony. But it wouldn't hurt to. To, to write it down so that you know. One of the reasons uh, part of this is like rote is, is that you you memorize. I memorize this. I know in a major scale what my four chord is. I know what my five chord and my six and my seven. I know all that stuff. But that came from memorization because I don't want to have to sit there and think about it. But once you know it for one major scale, you know it for all of them. So the next one Starts on G. What's the what's the third above G? The third above B. Third above D. Okay. So now, now we suddenly have a, a situation of a chord we've not heard yet. And the reason is G in three part harmony is a major chord. But look what happens when you get to this is the five of D. So you, we're not confused, we're talking about chords right now. Mm -hmm. So the five of G is D, and then our next third is F. But F is a whole step away from G. Just like the minor seventh was a whole step away. This is what, because this chord is a major, has the quality of being a major, on this degree scale step, when you create a four part chord, or G, it's called a dominant sub. This is different than a major, it's much different than a major sub. And we usually, we notate it like this when we're talking about it. We say it's a flat seven. Almost all blues, funk music, is built on the sound of the dominant chord. It sounds like this. I'm going to demonstrate it to you in the key of C. I'm going to show you that this is a major. This is a major seven. That's dominant. These are dominant sounds. not got a major seventh in it, it's got a flattened seventh. And that's the sound of the dominant. This chord in the key of C, the G, is the heaviest, this, this chord is always pulling to the one. It wants to go home. <laughs> and yeah, and the reason for that is, if I gave you a technical explanation, there's a reason for it. It's because the distance between the three the third of the chord, which is B, and seventh is what's called in music is called a tritone. It's a it's a it's a like in the key of G. This is a G. G seven. That's a tritone. This was an interval that was not allowed to be used in the Middle Ages because they thought it was of the devil. Seriously, it was not. That interval is the one you couldn't use it. But because that interval resides in a dominant seventh when we get there and we do a four part harmony, that interval resides diatonically, right, between the B and the F. We suddenly have a chord that has a major quality to it, but it also has a tenseness to it. It wants to go somewhere. 
and uh, and maybe that's why I mean in certain forms of music like I'm thinking like blues there's a lot of uh, R and B music that's like that it's it's bass funk music a lot of Motown music I mean they would actually start the song songs in the tonic would start the song on the one flat seven which is right out of the chute you're not diatonic anymore. You're creating, you're creating something that's not diatonic because the one chord is always a major seven in the major scale. But it's that, it's that sound quality between this and this. So it has. This has a, there's an edginess to it. I mean, I love, I love dominant seven chords. And, and, and also, in jazz music, this chord, the five chord, is the one that can take more tension than any other chord like that. This is the chord, when you see, like, if you're reading jazz charts or anything, if you see chords that say 7 flat 9, 7 sharp 9, 7 flat 9 sharp 5, 7 sharp 9 sharp 11, it's always on some form of the five chord. 99% of the time. Because that chord can take the tension. It's already got tension built into it. So you can make extensions to it, and alterations to it, and embellishments to it. So now we have this. We went all the way up to the G. We basically in four part harmony now. So that's our five chord. Again, let me, I'm going to keep reiterating this because I think it's really important. I'm talking, now I'm talking, I'm back to scale steps. I'm not talking to the steps within the chord. That was a great, a great point that you brought up. When I'm talking about the chord, all of a sudden that's the one. It's the five and C. When I'm talking about creating the chord for it, it becomes the one so that you know that it's made of a one, three, five, and a seven. So just to give you an example, like I'm in, a key, in the key, like if I'm playing a G7, I can do this. You may not think that's a very consonant sound, but if I slide it back up to here, that's a seven with a flattened fifth. Here's a seventh with an augmented fifth. And here's a seventh with a raised ninth. Well, what if, I mean, you hear that chord goes, ah, oh, it's just a crazy sound, but then it goes to here. Everything's right with the world. You know, I mean, you've got all that tension right there, and then, and that's what jazz musicians play off of all the time. And, and part of the reason that that happened in jazz is that the singers would be singing, and that, like you would be playing, you'd get to the five chord, or G, but the singer would be singing the flat five, or singing the sharp five, or the flat nine, the sharp nine. But you can do that. You can take all of that tension and then resolve it. So that's, that's the, uh, the whole thing about the dominant chord. That's also, by the way, it's a dominant seventh chord. It's also called the dominant. It's the dominant. It's the, it's the chord all of the others aspire to. It's got, it's got so much power. It really does. I mean, it's, uh, um, I, I told in one class this before, but like, uh, when I was growing up, I was I was a kid. I was playing rock and roll music, and what we played was called the one, the four, and the five. So we da 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 they play the five and then they go to the one. That has a completely different sound. That's like that's like in the key of C if I went to this chord. And then this one. I altered the seven chord. I made it a thirteen. But it's the same thing. That's worlds away from You know what I mean? I mean that's what we were doing as kids, you know, just 
you know, and then the F and then G, and we thought, we thought that was great. <laughs> and then we, we, you know, you go on a little bit further and you see all of these chords with all these numbers on them and you kind of just want to run out of the room screaming. But it all, it's all mathematics. That's all it is. So after this one, we go to this degree, which is the sixth degree in C. I'm talking about scales again. I'm talking about chord tones. Which is an A minor. That's also an A minor. And if we did in three-part harmony, we'd have a one. Talking about chords now. One, three, five, seven. So now it's a minor seven. Because it's a minor chord and it also has a whole step between the seven. The last one is, is uh, sort of the, the unwanted one in the, in the set. It's the one that, you know, it's completely different than everything else. When you go, I don't expect you to remember this, but when you go to four-part harmony, this diminished chord becomes a half-diminished. Half-diminished? Well, there's also such a thing as a wholly diminished chord. This one is not that chord. This is B, D, F, and then you're back to the octave again. So here's the recap. That's called a half diminished? Half diminished. And it's written like this. It's written in many different ways. I think this is the easiest. <coughs> it's a null set to the seven. Like if I, if I were to write it, it would be that, it would look like that. B half diminished. B whole diminished would look like this. It doesn't have a little, little line through the zero. That's fully diminished. That's half diminished. The reason it's half diminished is because the seventh scale degree right here, where it ends up on A, for in order for it to be fully diminished, would have to be an A flat, which it's not. Then, if you had that, you'd have a fully diminished chord. In this case, only have a half diminished chord. The other thing that I want to, um, I'm just going to touch on this briefly, I, I think this is a lot of material to digest because it's a lot of numbers, it's a lot of thinking. What's your name? Mm -hmm. Kathy. Kathy. Kathy gets the star for the best question mm -hmm. asked. Don't confuse the scale with the way you're creating the chords. It's all numbers. These are how when you create the chords, this is what they are called. When you're actually creating, when you're making the chords, each one starts, like D will become like it's, it's the one. E will become like it's the one. F will become like it's the one. But you're still in the C system. Does that make sense? I'm getting it. It's kind of like learning a new language. Yes. And there's all these words, but you maybe get this amount of the yes. words. It's definitely like learning a new language. It's exactly what a different way of communicating. I mean, music is a language. So, uh, and, and actually, the way, I mean, the way that words mean something, to me, tones and chords mean something. They speak uh, in a different language, but they're, uh, and depending on how they're put together. Music, I mean, for me, it's the best music to me is something that uh, evokes some kind of a visceral response. It can be the simplest thing in the world or the most complicated thing, but it has to evoke some sort of response. Wow. Like it's, it's making me listen to it, you know. It has to have that. For me, that's, that's what good music is to me. I generally dislike background music. I mean, it's sort of like, I, I, don't, I don't quite get it. I mean, no elevator music, I call it. Because um, uh, I think really, really good music can, can really, really be Music. They do music because they can't, they have to do it. So you, you don't do it for money. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking about church or anything. I mean, when I was, when I was young, you don't, you don't do it for money. You do it because you love it. It's just, you have to do it. So, um, and then learning about it to me, it's like, it's just, uh, it's the way I, I'm wired uh, mentally. Is I, I need to understand. Once you understand this stuff, you can translate that across.
across to other scales. You can translate that to, to when you're singing. You can you can start going, even if you can't read music, so I see the notes going up there. And if you have a keyboard, you can see, oh, it's going up, you know, three half steps, it's going up a minor third, it's going up a second. You start doing that, and then all of a sudden it starts clicking. You know, oh, I'm singing a second, I'm singing a major third, I'm singing a fourth, I'm singing a fifth. So, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna kind of pause it right here, just for, um, because I think <laughs> it's it's even more than I thought it was when I first started. I'm just gonna I'll breeze through. But it is. It's it, it's a lot. It is a lot to think about. It's a lot to digest. But if you do have access to a, to a keyboard or a piano, just just start listening to those sounds. And when you listen to the radio, even if it's from a very um, very primitive, like when you start, you don't. Doing, but you start you start hearing sounds, you start hearing sounds that you like, then start quantifying. Even if you don't know what to call them like this, I like I like in that song, I like the way that melody goes. Like that, that that's how I did it. And then, you know, there were certain chords that I would learn and I'd go, I love that chord, and then I would just use it until everybody was sick of it. <laughs> you know, I mean it's just what you do when you're a kid, you just play the same thing over and over again. <laughs> people tell you they're not even listen to you anymore. Stop playing it. Um, but that's the way it gets in here. And then after a while, it gets in here. So then it just comes out. It just, does. It just comes out. Okay, is there any any questions? Tony, do you have some questions for me? Yes, actually, it's about. Circle of fifths. Circle of fifths? Yeah. We can do that. Is that oh, everybody no, no, no. thought I saw on the next page? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All uh, for key signature. Yeah. If all, all of this is, and I explained this before, I want to completely demystify this. All this means is because every other scale here, every other system right here that you see wants to be just like C. And in order for it to do that, you have to introduce accidentals into it. And the circle of fifths means exactly that. You're going around in fifths. So if I'm going around and I'm to my next, and these are what we are calling sharp keys. Sharp keys go up a half step, flat keys go down a half step. So if you see that in music, you see this. That's an F note, but it's a half step above that. On the black keys. So is that a sharp? That's a sharp. It looks like a hashtag. The other one is a flat. It's like a little B. That means it's going down the half step. So all the circle of fifths, that I'm, I think this is the easiest way to explain it. G wants to sound, the G scale wants to sound just like the C scale because it has to sound that way because we tell it it has to sound that way. A G major scale has to have the same intervals has to have the same assortment of whole tone, whole tone, half tone, exactly like the C scale. In order for that to happen, I'm just going to oversimplify this. In order for that to happen, the note between the seventh degree of the G and the next note has to be a half step, like we like in C, it has to be B to C. Well, if we didn't have a sharp, what we have here is an F to a G, and we can't have that. So, in order for our mathematics to be satisfied, in order for the actual scale to sound like it's supposed to sound, we have to put an F sharp in there. And that's where you get the first sharp. That number one means that it has one sharp in the key signature. So, whenever you see something in the key of G, you'll see the F sharp, even if you don't read music, I'll tell you that, that, that hashtag is on the F line. That means that any time you come across an F in the key of G, you have to play it as an F sharp, not as an F natural. So the next guy we come to, fifth or G, <coughs> they, they call a circle of fifths because this is how mathematically it works out. It makes the most sense. And it also tells you how many sharps are in the key signature. So the next one, the key of D, has two sharps. And in order for the same formula, it wants to be like C. In order for it to sound like C, have the C major scale sound like C, we have to introduce another sharp. 
and that one happens to be on the third degree, which we've already got, F sharp, and on the seventh degree, C sharp. Because if we didn't have the C sharp, we'd have, again, we'd have a whole step between the seventh and the octave, and we need a half step. So in order for it to be a half step, you have to put that guy in there. Just like the three, the first third has to be a major third. That has to be four half steps away. And if, if you don't have that in the key signature, all of a sudden it's F, and that doesn't work. So we had to raise the F half step. You'll also notice that these are incremental, which means that the F is going to show up in every one of these other key signatures. The C sharp is going to show up in every one of the key signatures. And each time you introduce a new sharp, you're going to see it in the other ones that fall. So that the sharps actually fall in the... Sorry. Oh, did you know that? No. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So the first sharp is on F, the second one's on C, the third one's on G, the fourth's on D, the fifth's on A. And they also have a sequence to them, too. Mm -hmm. They actually go up in fourths. So what is it about C that makes all the other keys want to be like C? Uh, it, it is. It is all it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, that's basically <laughs> what it is. Yeah, it's, it's, in a sense, it's arbitrary. It just happens to be on the keyboard. It's the one key where you don't have any accidentals, where you yeah, don't have yeah. anything like that. I could have started with any one of these keys, but then I would have to backtrack and say uh, at some point, well, C doesn't have any of those, and you go, why doesn't it? Because C satisfies all of the criteria of making a major scale without having to have an accidental What's the split Thing. Oh. Why is the A in the middle and okay. not the E in the B? Good question. I don't understand. Good question. That is what in musical parlance is known as a relative minor. Minor? Yeah. Okay. And that's based on the sixth degree of the scale. Okay. So in the key of C, your sixth degree is A. And what that means is that you can have a song that can be in the key of A minor and it shares the same key signature okay. as C does. And for any scale, like in the key of G, it would be E. In D, it would be B, okay. sixth scale degree. So you can't automatically say, I see two sharps that's in the key of D. I mean, most of the time it will be, but it could be in B minor. It doesn't mean anything other than that the home chord sounds minor, doesn't sound major. And you can hear that pretty much right away. And a lot of times you can hear that at the end of the song whatever note it's resolving to, or if there's a cadential part of the song, you can see where, where it's going to. Is it going to the one, or is it going to the six? It's kind of like just, you know, I, it, I, think it's I think it's more important in classical music than it is actually in, in the, it doesn't matter, because it doesn't matter the way you play, you still have two sharps, or three sharps, or four sharps, or whatever it is. So as you're moving along here, you get to A, you have three sharps. I'm not going to tell you what they are anymore. You have four sharps in E, five sharps in B, six sharps in F sharp. Everybody loathes playing in this key. Well, maybe not piano players, because it's all the black keys, isn't it? Not like very much. Yeah. On the capo. <laughs> Guitar players just put this device called a capo on the neck. And then you just play everything that you're used to, but you just, you've already, you don't have to worry about anything. That's my secret. In salsa, lo que play with the chicks. In salsa, yeah. It's what? In um, Latin rim salsa, oh, okay. love to play in F. In, in F sharp? Yeah, yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Love it. Wow. That's complicated, but yeah, it's more easy in, in trumpet and trombone play like that. Yes, in some instruments that transpose, it may be an yes. actually easier key mm -hmm. to play in. Yeah, yes. that's true. There are things called transposing instruments. Like I'm not going to try not to get on a rabbit trail here, but there's certain like like the, some of the saxophones. They actually are pitched. They're 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 uh, their notes. When we're playing a C, they're playing like an E flat or an A flat. 
concert wise. So that, that opens up, that's a whole other thing. That's like transposing. We don't need to do that right now. <laughs> but yeah, and also for those of you that have a Macintosh, I believe the startup chime is F sharp. Yeah. I mean, what? <laughs> Those guys are crazy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so if you go up in fifths, you can also go down in fifths. And if you go down in fifths, you get to the flat keys. So, in order for F to sound just like C, it'll have a B flat in it. And the same thing holds true here. In order for B flat to sound like, like C, it'll have a B flat and an E flat in it. This is always so it satisfies our formula. It always goes back to that. The formula has to be satisfied. And that's the whole reason for key signatures and keys. And the whole reason for other keys is obviously so we can modulate. So we can go up, we can shift, we can go here, we can go there. I mean, you wouldn't want every song to just be in the key of C. Well, that's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play everything in C. And then as we travel down here, I didn't write the numbers in, but that would be one flat, that would be two flats, that would be three, that would be four, that would be five, that would be six. You'll notice also that there's an overlap between these two. That's because they're the same thing. A G flat and an F sharp are the same note. To us, they are. Most flats and sharps the same thing? Yeah. Yes. Except that if I'm in the key of, let's say I'm in the key of G, I'm not going to call F sharp G flat. That's kind of a taboo thing to do. You don't do that. You call it by. And if you're if you're working with a line where the line is ascending, you generally, when you're ascending, you call the note that's going up to a next note, you, you sharp that note. When you're coming down, you flatten it. So those are called, uh, if you want another $10 word, that's called an enharmonic equivalent. Just so like F sharp and G flat are the same thing. C sharp and D flat are the same thing. So if I'm, in, if I'm playing, and I hope I never am, in the key of D flat, you know, I don't, I don't call it a sharp. I don't call anything in, in, a, in, a, in a flat key and call it a sharp. It's just, it's not that it's wrong. Well, it is that it's wrong, but it's not that it doesn't, that it sounds wrong. It doesn't sound wrong. If you play a G flat and I say, I'm going to play an F sharp, we're going to play the same note. But contextually and for, for uh, identification purposes, it's best to stay within the system. Because it just gets more and more confusing if you do that. The best way is just to learn it right the first time you do it right. So does that, is that pretty clear about the circle of this? How everything wants to be C, and this is how they do it. I, I mean, I would remember it that way. Okay, Matt, you got a question? No. Oh. <laughs> I'll quiz him later. So it's just clear from the ship I didn't know. Okay. I understand the major, yeah. all that. Yeah. But the minor, how do you determine what note is the minor? Like. By the, a minor what's or a the major? mathematical formula okay. that goes with that major? Since we have a triadic formula that we use to make chords, mm -hmm. when whatever chord you're starting from, you have the one, the three, the five, the seven, the four part harmony. Okay? So just pick a note. Um, pick any note. Let's pick the um, E. Well, in the key of E, you remember okay. from the circle of this, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to be a little punchy. Um, in the circle of this, the key of E has four sharps. That's so it can sound like C. Right, I get So, them. when you get to the third, that's the note that it's going to be. Okay. The next note's going to be this. And the seventh note is going to be that in the key of E. Now, what uh, I'll call this sort of like, uh, it just came to me, I think it's maybe a pretty good analogy. It's sort of like gender, the, the gender that it's going to be 
is determined by this interval. And that's that's the, the interval between the one and the three in a chord. That determines whether it's major or minor. Right. If it has four half steps, it's major. Okay. If it has three and a half, <laughs> three half steps. Right. Yeah. Three half steps, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not even minor. Yeah. Four <laughs> half steps, thank you. It's minor. That determines, that's the gender determinant of right. chord, whether it's major or minor. Okay. How, how come in this thing it's got like, it's got the E and then it's got the C sharp here? Well, that's the relative minor. That's because the sixth how do, scale How degree, would I determine that? The sixth. If you went up, like from the formula, mm -hmm. and you created it, you would find your sixth degree would be C sharp. So the... satisfy the, the formula. So the sixth one is always a relative minor? Yes. And any... Yes. Any one that we start with, yes. number six is always a relative always minor. Relative. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Okay. That's immutable. Everything else is like fluid, but that's immutable. Okay. Six degrees <laughs> always. Yeah. Okay. This is a relative minor. Okay. And the reason it's C sharp is because it, again, it wants to be like C, has to satisfy that, has to be that amount. We're half steps away from the <coughs> preceding note, and that many half steps away from the subsequent note. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I'm a, I'm a mathematician, so oh, I, the well, only you, way I can look at this is like with math. You should take to this. That's easy. the only. <laughs> that's the only way I can like figure out what. Would it, I'm would it help if like seven, seven, something, something? Yeah. I mean, because it is. Sorry. Okay, like we did before. This is what it would be like in the E. Okay, can you see that? Uh -huh. Same thing, but now this is E. Uh -huh. In order to satisfy all of our formulas like this, between those notes, uh -huh. all of a sudden, this one's got to be a half step away, it's, or, or a whole step away. It's not. Okay, so you have to sharpen. Right. Is that guy? Kind of right. Now this is all of a sudden. This is a half step away. Can't mm -hmm. be. Mhm. Right. Right. Okay. So that that's okay because that's a half step away. Whole whole half. Yep. Whole whole half. Mhm. Here's your four sharps. Whole 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 half. And all of a sudden, it look, it's just like the C. Exact same interval distance. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's the only way I can understand okay. it by counting. Yeah. That's a great way to understand. Only it. Way. Yeah, and you could do that with any any uh, key mm -hmm. that you started with. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't know how they got that determine what is the relative minor. Yes, the, the the third, the first third between the tonic and the, the next note is the determinant of whether it's major or minor. Oh, oh yeah, okay. That I get, but this, which was a rel, which how they got the A, the E, yeah. the B, how they C. determine what's the, oh, the six. Okay, thank See, you very much. See, all of a sudden, much. there it is, right there. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. I've taxed you enough. <laughs> so, thank you. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> and you just made a sharp comment. <laughs> <laughs>